All right. Coming at you all the way live from the lower bottoms of West Oakland. This is Revolution. I've been talking off air, if you will, with the guest of tonight's episode, today's episode. He is the publisher of um, Zero Books. And I love a lot of his books, and I've been lucky enough to get two of his authors here, Rob Larson, uh, who wrote Capitalism and Freedom. That was Zero Books, right? Yep. And Ben Burgess, who right. I made laugh uh, pretty good. That's, yeah, he's not. He's not. He's not hard to make laugh. He's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> now, can I make? Can I make the Douglas Lane chuckle? That's the question. Uh, I don't know. You're I'm serious, pretty, dude. I'm, I'm pretty grumpy these days, but we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, I should also point out. I always like to point out. I'm also the novelist behind a book called Bash Bash Revolution and one called Billy Moon, and uh, so I'm, I'm a publisher. As, but I'm also a, a writer myself. Just always, I always feel like uh, people who end up uh, doing the publishing side of the of the of the business are the people who couldn't hack it as actual <laughs> authors. And I want to point like out that's not me, not right. entirely. So uh, you know. Well, let, let me ask you this: Are you like us musicians who have to start their own label to get their music out? Did you have to start your own publishing company to get your books out? No man, I um I got published by uh, Tor, which is uh, an imprint of Macmillan. That's oh, my shit. first my first novel, and then then it didn't sell very well, so I went back to the publisher who published my first short story collection, uh, which is Nightshade Books. They published uh, last week's Apocalypse back in two thousand six, and then they published uh, my second and third novels, um, which was After the Saucers Landed and Bash Bash Revolution. And now I don't know if they're even going to stay in business. Um, and now I might be publishing my future work with zero. Uh, I'm hoping <laughs> I can get that to work out. I want to write a nonfiction book. I mean, I've written one nonfiction book in the past and did self-publish that. And I, but I'd like to, uh, you know, try my hand at the kind of book that I publish as a, the publishing manager at zero, uh, you know, on, on theory and rather than a short story about a, a a nerdy protagonist who's just a <laughs> thinly veiled version of myself. I've 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 before this before this episode I decided I was going to fall down back down a rabbit hole of your stuff. I I think I told you when we were talking back and forth on the internet that I discovered you um around the same time I discovered Ben Burgess on your Zero Books YouTube channel. Yeah. And I love the videos that you do. I know people, when I read the comments, people are always making some sort of pop shot at the videos, but it takes me back to like crazy 80s shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the, there's, there's two kinds of videos that are on the channel. Now there's Ben Burgess's videos as a primary alternative kind, meaning mm -hmm. it's just him sitting in front of his, like in his kitchen in front of his yeah. camera. <laughs> yeah. Basically giving a lesson on how to, use logic to defeat right wing uh, scumbags. And then there's the videos I make, which I, I write an essay, read it into a microphone and then use whatever footage I, I can from the, the Pringlinger uh, archive or somewhere else to illustrate my, my deep, deep ideas about uh, socialism. Um, but, but it really is an autodidactic process of making these videos. Cause I'm always researching and thinking and reading other theorists and stuff and, Lately, they're just like almost just a, a slew of citations. <laughs> as you, as you can no, tell what I'm no, I'm, I'm like I took so many notes the other day, and you had me go down a rabbit hole. I, the way I look at even this show is, if I give you an introduction to to some theory or some thought or even like a history lesson you didn't know about, go down the rabbit hole and read more about it. And that's definitely what your videos did for me. Even just recently, uh, some of the stuff you were talking about, uh, Adorno and the protests. Right. And it led me down a rabbit hole of those 1877 um, um, uh, riots. I don't want to call them riots. Protests. The, the railroad strikes. Yeah. The first time ever that the U.S. government sent the military on its own people. 
Right. Although I think there was, you know, the federal forces were also trying to enforce reconstruction around the same time. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, what, what came first or, but it was certainly, uh, the first time that, you know, you, you've got hundreds of, of <laughs> dead rail workers killed by U S military. So yeah, yeah, yeah. was it 10,000 people were striking at, at one in one yeah. in Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah, it was um, like Baltimore and and uh, like all it's all down the line, right? I mean, I'll look it up because I no Baltimore, West Virginia, Pennsylvania. Oh no, no, I brother, I told you I went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but the reason I thought about you know reason that came up was because I was thinking about the um, what's called the crisis in Marxism, which is this moment in the eighteen nineties when the uh, social democratic party in Germany was debating whether or not they should continue on as a revolutionary party with the aim of uh, basically uh, taking over the state through, you know, supporting uh, the, the workers struggle and, you know, a violent kind of confrontation with the state or whether or not they could uh, through the parliamentary process reform their way to socialism Mm -hmm. uh, through participation. And, um, the reason why it, that was, a something that people were debating was because there hadn't been a, the predicted kind of revolutionary response from the big crisis of the 19th century or late 19th century, uh, the economic crisis, which was the long depression, which, you know, spread across the world, uh, starting in 1873. And which is one of the reasons why those railroad strikes happened in 1877, mm -hmm. Uh, because they, they, they were striking for higher wages at a time when they were facing a wage cut um, as the railroads were struggling to stay afloat um, because of the economic crisis. And uh, one of the banks that had like uh, invested in um, uh, railroad construction went under and it just set the whole industry into, into uh, chaos. And so, I was wondering, I'm wondering about, you know, this is, this is coming up for me because I'm thinking about the crisis we're in now and how we can look back to the great depression. And even before that, to the long depression and see these moments, which by Marxist theory should be revolutionary moments. They should lead to an uprising of the proletariat and, 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 and a change to socialism. And they have not, they didn't even as far back, you know, as 1893, uh, there was a boom after the long depression. And uh, so the, the burn Ed, Edward Bernstein was the kind of reformist side of the debate back then against people like Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and uh, there, you know, at that moment there was sort of a split between the social democratic evolutionary approach of Bernstein and the radical revolutionary approach of people like Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg. And, uh, and, you know, we're still sort of stuck in this split on the left and and can't quite uh, – we haven't overcome the difficulty that I think uh, was th even there back then. And and I saw – I watched a couple different videos because you've been, you've been spitting out quite a few. Um, and you had an interesting one recently on the protests out by you in Portland. Yeah. Which are getting kind of rowdy. Right. Uh, yeah, I think they're dying off now because the DHS uh, decided to phase out its participation or its, you know, engagement with the protesters. In other words, they're not tear gassing people in the streets anymore or rounding them up and taking them away in unmarked vans anymore, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and they're they're, not, they're leaving. So, my understanding is that the last time there was a a protest, it was far less violent and and there was less of an issue than there had been when the the feds were there. And the stories coming out of Portland are so varied, right? There's one, I read one article, I want to say it was in NBC or Newsweek, where it was like, there's there's too many white people here protesting. You could say I, that about any part of Portland, any day of the week. <laughs> I, I've been to, brother, I've been to Portland, oh God, I, I've probably been to Portland, Oregon more times than I've been to Sacramento, California in the last 10 years. Yeah. And People tell me that there is this alleged black neighborhood, but I always tell them, if you think that's when the Blazers are playing, that doesn't count. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know where it is. 
I had a conservative friend uh, of mine come to visit me from Ohio. Not mm -hmm. really conservative, but sort of like a cent not a leftist. So for me, that's a conservative. Gotcha. But yeah. no, I feel you. Yeah, and 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 he's like walking around my neighborhood, and he said, there, "Is there anyone who lives here is not white?" I said, "Um, I think maybe. I think I saw some Asian people once." Um, he's and he's like, "It's like, look, I'm a white guy from Ohio, and uh, this strikes me as weird." So, <laughs> and, oh uh, yeah, right. So yeah, it's a really white state, and it's a really white state for really ugly reasons. Um historically but uh horrible history that even goes yeah. back to the 50s yeah it, it well it, it it's certainly i'm not sure when uh things really loosened up and got a little better but i know that you know around the time of, like it was for a while in the 19th century and, and maybe even after but for in the 19th century it's illegal to be a black man in oregon mm -hmm. so or a black woman or you know whatever but yeah it was yeah it's very bad uh history in Oregon, we give the South a run for their money when it comes to uh, racism, I guess. The, and, the, and in Eugene, the North, yeah. there are mm -hmm. like, you know, Eugene is this uh, little college town, lots of radical anarchists and left, far left wing types there. But then right outside of town, you also got your little enclaves of Nazis. So it's a so it's a fucked up uh, place. Real dialectical. Do you, do you remember when Portland was on the cover of, I believe it was Time for being where the skinheads was like neo Nazi yeah. capital of the America was Portland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was like right around the time I moved here. I think or right, right before it was like the late eighties, early nineties, right? Uh, I want to say ninety three, ninety five. Oh, is it that late? Okay. Uh, yeah. Because I, I remember listening in like early nineties when I'm living in a studio apartment in downtown Portland, listening to. Uh, the trial of this neo-Nazi guy who uh, um, they were they were trying to stick him with uh, the responsibility for the murder of uh, this Ethiopian immigrant who'd been killed by uh, some of his some of his people, some of these young men who'd been part of his group. And they were like, you know, it's sort of like he was the uh, Manson uh, to these mm -hmm. kids. And um, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, I think it was Metzger's is the guy's name, but I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah, you know, it's no, it's it's a yeah, it's fucked up. But we also have a lot of uh, lefties. In that Portland. you do, yeah, that you do. Um, I re there's a movie. I don't know if you watch horror movies. It's uh, I'd say in the last year or so, it's called Green Room. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that one. Has anyone told you about it? No, tell me about it. Uh, it's about a, a punk band that is on tour and they're broke as fuck. Something that if the tour musician is listening, know all, all too well about. Yeah. And they play a show to like a handful of people. And someone at the show says, hey, my cousin has a spot you can play and you can make a few hundred bucks if you go play this spot. It's just up north. I want to say they actually say it's in Portland. Mm -hmm. I forget where they say it is, but it, it so looks like Portland. And it ends up being kind of out in the cuts, in the in the woods, and it ends up being a neo-Nazi hangout. And these guys that are not Nazis whatsoever end up playing a neo-Nazi spot. They end up accidentally seeing a murder, and then it goes downhill from there. Uh, Jean-Luc Picard plays the the leader of the neo-Nazis. It's it's a pretty awesome movie. You mean uh, Patrick Stewart? Uh-huh. Oh, cool. Okay, I have to check that out. Professor X, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um well you know uh back to the 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 protests though and the and the um the the whiteness of the protests i do know that you know there was there's an effort being made in portland and in in eugene as well to you know for the for you know you're not going to say white people shouldn't be out protesting uh for black exactly. lives matter exactly. but there has been an effort made to like make sure that the leadership of these newly forming organizations are uh, people of color and mostly black. Um, and I don't know exactly. I mean, it's always a, it's always tricky to figure out how to, to do that properly because on, <laughs> on the one hand, well, no, but seriously, on the one hand, if you have, if you're, if you're in a town like Eugene and you've got like 60 people who are involved or, or 24 people who are involved mm -hmm. who aren't white and you're saying you're the leadership and you have, and they have to do now all the work for of the organ, like the primary work. 
of the organizing, right? Mm -hmm. They're the mm -hmm. ones going to meeting after meeting after meeting and making the decisions, but also doing the work. Then you're going to burn out these young kids who are being, you know, put in this position and not getting the support they need, but it's, they're not getting the support they need from all the other people in the organization because they are trying to make sure that they have power. Yes. So it's a, I don't know. It's a contradiction. It's, it's not easy to just uh, figure out what to do. Um, but my own kid uh, uh, is uh, dating one of the leaders, leaders of the uh, BIPOC group in, in Eugene. And she's like, which, by the way, it took a long time because she was telling him for a while. I I like you, but I I'm I've got to dedicate my whole life to the movement. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't get distracted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that actually sounds so sad. I know. Um, but it, it, you know, the, it, she wore down eventually, and uh, uh, but you know, she's going to f f you know, like every day of the week, five hours, six hours, seven hour meetings. And uh, oh, she's wow. complaining that they that they need, you know, that it doesn't make sense that, you know, the people that she's really friends with and act, you know, she's friends with lots of different kinds of people, including white people, of course. And like, why can't all you people come in and help us out and do some do some of this work? So it's a it's a strange situation. It's it's an interesting time to to see all this stuff blow up because. I'm sure you remember in the 90s when we had Rodney King, which was the first yeah. time a lot of Americans saw a black dude getting his ass whooped, not in a march. Right. right? We all saw Martin Luther King and, and all those ass whoopings. But that isn't a yeah, different I wasn't, context. I wasn't around. I wasn't around back. I'm not that old. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we you have to see it in every February. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like oh, it. yeah. I, I, I saw every... the old footage. I saw the yeah. old footage, you know. But I was old enough. I was in my teens and 20s when, when Rodney King and all that went down. Yeah, I was a I was a young teenager when he got his when he got uh, whooped on by the police and yeah and you and you see that and you see it over and you see it over again and we saw how Southern California just blew up, but it kind of stayed in Southern California. It was a Southern California thing, and yeah. even with Trayvon Martin and and what what happened Michael Brown and Ferguson those were mm -hmm. Ferguson things those were Florida things. Yeah. George Floyd for and I think a lot of it has to do with the COVID lockdown. Uh, I had I had Cedric Johnson on the show. He brought that up, too. I think some of it is a reaction to, to Donald Trump. Yeah. We've never had a president this over the top cartoonishly villainous. Yeah. Um, I think it was definitely the pandemic and everything you just said. Uh, absolutely. Um, but, you know, that made it go across the whole country. Um, for sure. What I would, uh, what I would say is that we should be nonetheless, like we should think about what happened in 92, even though this is mm -hmm. bigger mm -hmm. because what happened in 92 was that there were these massive riots. There's lots of protests and there was a lot of media coverage, even though it wasn't, you know, sweeping the nation in terms of people in the streets, it was still the major topic of conversation across America for during the campaign of 92. And Bill Clinton turned it into a campaign issue at the time. And this is something I, I kind of only realized in retrospect of exactly how this all worked out. But he turned it into a campaign issue and he said, look, Reagan and Bush have ignored the inner cities. They've ignored, they've ignored the plight of, of black America. And we have to come in and fix it. And we have to make sure that uh, black people have every opportunity to start businesses we have to make sure that the that the culture of dependency is broken. <laughs> this is Bill Clinton. <laughs> we and you know and and his way of addressing it was uh, basically to deepen the neoliberal turn and to cut and to get rid of welfare as we knew it and mm -hmm. um, uh, and it didn't do a whole hell of a lot for the, the people in L.A. who had been suffering before it didn't it didn't lift all boats any more than trickle down economics had under reagan but uh he managed to take the outrage that had been you know that was directed at the republican party and uh as well as the cops and mm -hmm. use it for a neoliberal agenda and i think uh 
we're very much in a, in a situation where that could be the outcome again, if we don't uh, get a little bit smarter than we're, than we're being at the moment. Although I don't know. I mean, it, it, we were talking about this before the, when you started recording, I, I, I think that the black lives matter movement will be somewhat eclipsed in the m- next couple of months as like, what is it? Half of all renters are going to be evicted in America. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that, I mean, not that the, the black lives matter movement won't, uh, it may be of the leader, uh, take on a leadership position, like a vanguard of the, of the overall struggle, but it's going to be t- have to take up. We're all going to have to take up this kind of general problem of, of uh, the working class getting royally fucked as the economy is crashing and, you know, living in a system that really isn't going to be able to get us all through this pandemic. Um, It's, you know, you know, we're being asked to basically go live in the streets and expose ourselves to the virus, either at work or Mm -hmm. out on those streets um, in order to try to hold on to a kind of system that wasn't working for us before, you know, let alone now. Do you feel like, so I had Gerald Horn on uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Professor Gerald Horn, and we were talking about Black Lives Matter. And he, he of course, likes a lot of the progress that he sees with, with what they've done so far in this, in this new version of them, right? This, this resurgence, if you will. Yeah. But he also critiqued the fact that they really don't have centralized leadership. Yeah, and, I, and it's uh, it's hard to synthesize a message. So, fuck the police is a real easy message to get across, or defund them, fuck them, however you want to put it. That's kind of the message, right? Yeah. And it, it's like, how do you synthesize the next message, which is we need housing, we need rent moratoriums, we need healthcare, and and watching like old footage of King speak and reading old King speeches. He always had a message of we need these basic human rights. Yeah. I, well, I think that the leadership of the black lives matter movement should be the Amazon workers uh, mm. who've been trying to go on strike and, or, you know, basically trying to organize for their own protection and, and, and needs uh, since the very beginning. And, uh, I think a guy like Chris Smalls um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has been kind of thrust into history and uh, that, you know, he's trying to form an organization um, that isn't quite a union, but isn't quite not a union to, um, to help essential workers. And I think he wants to bring on teachers as well to organize for their own self-protection and then their own interests. And uh, yeah, I think that's where black lives matter should should go next. I mean, that's where uh, I know that's not, you know, directly about the police issue, um, but it's not disconnected either uh, no. because, because if you are going to be evicted or you're uh, being forced to, or, you know, if you're, you're trying to st- organize a strike uh, illegally, who's going to come down to, to enforce the eviction or smash your illegal strike. It's going to be the cops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the same people who murdered George Floyd are going to be the ones to enforce what ends up being racist policies and laws anyway, because if you look at who it is, that's working in warehouses across this country. I mean, there are some white people, but there are an awful lot of of black and Hispanic people and people from all over the world, immigrants who are working really rough jobs and, and now unsafe jobs, very unsafe jobs. It's it's so frightening to see what – when the teachers were striking, I don't know if you were following any of the teachers' strike in L.A. and, and then also in uh, – and here in Oakland, we had a big strike too. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things they were asking for was affordable housing. And that kind of got muffled in a lot of the talk when it got to the mainstream media when they would talk about the strikes. Yeah. Because teachers can't afford to live in the cities they teach in, which isn't how I grew up. My teachers lived in the community. We have a city uh, in Silicon Valley. We'll just we'll just talk about. It. We don't need to name the names of cities, but one of the most or the most expensive sale or overprice of overbidding of a house happened in Silicon Valley. It was eight hundred plus thousand dollars over asking for a three bedroom, two bathroom house. Wow, and 
how can you be a mailman in that area and and live there? How can you be a teacher or a school administrator even in that area and live there when you're dealing with people that can cash out a 401k on you and put down 800000 over asking just because they want a house near where they work? It's obscene, really. Um, yeah, I think that affordable housing, rent control um, uh, as well. Uh, that's got to be part of the demand. Like, I think the, the demands right now should be uh, for, well, first of all, demilitarize uh, the police and kick mm-hmm. out the KKK. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, really get rid of the, the, the Klansmen and the cop, you know, that are cops. But, and then uh, job guarantees, federal job guarantee program. No one should be unemployed right now. Um, mm-hmm. And uh Yeah. Uh, uh, healthcare and and housing, those are all real. They're actually revolutionary demands because, in an economic time of economic crisis, those will be in direct contradiction to the needs of capital. And you know, it's not going to. You're not like Bernie Sanders would talk about his socialist revolution as being a way to make the system work more efficiently and be be healthier. But the truth is. Struggling for working class interests and, and rights, We're struggling for everybody's basic rights, uh, is going to end up right now in a time of economic crisis being a, a to struggle against the system's health. Mm. So uh, it, the, you know, but it, we have to do it. I mean, it's it's pretty much us or it. It's not even us or them. <laughs> you know? and, and, and you said something before before we started recording, too, that I didn't know. You said that Congress shut it down. Congress just didn't like there's, uh, you know, partisan bickering and the the um, the six hundred dollars a week uh, additional unemployment benefits are, are is set to expire and has has expired as of Friday. And the Congress um, just went home. They went, you know. The, the, their their session ended without any resolution, so there's it's very unclear as to what's going to happen next. Um, but yeah, it doesn't look like that's going to be like. A, I guess some states are going to do better than others, and in, in far as far as providing an emergency extension on their own. But as, as far as the federal program goes, there has been no negotiated arrangement, and each side like I think ha- each side wants to blame the other and like score political v- points uh, over the failure rather than figuring out a short, even short-term solution. How do you look at your constituents? How do you have a stump speech when you pretty much told them all to get fucked when you don't want to give them an extra $600? When you sit there it with shoes what you that cost more than these people. Pelosi, you say, Donald Trump wouldn't let us <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question i have for you yeah and, and we don't have to get too much into the the, the nitty nitty gritty of it so shahid butar is a friend of show i'm actually talking to him next week he's running against nancy pelosi yeah I definitely yeah. walked all over san francisco for shahid butar i love him now he takes her to task and he calls her out pretty good. And when he finally got that front page of the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, Nancy Pelosi challenger of the left, uh, I forget what the art, the headline was, but basically it was like, she won't debate him the next day. Some allegations come out and everybody runs from that man. What were the allegations? I haven't ca- I, I didn't catch wind of this. Uh, there was allegations that he was, and I'm going to sound like super belittling. Um, he was, he hit on a woman oh, like God. 17 years ago, and apparently he brushed up against her. And then he made light of her celibacy in front of friends. Um, 
it has now recently come out that this woman is a big time liar and she's been known to uh, throw these allegations out at other political figures of the left. Um, so let, let, now, now how old is what's this guy? I know who you're talking about. I've seen him interview, but I'm always, you know, a typical American can't remember foreign sounding <laughs> names. What, what, what was his name again? Boot Sh- uh, Shahid Butar. Sh- Shahid Butar. Well, uh-huh. how old is he now? He's your age. He's okay. So, seventeen years ago, he would have been thirty-two. Then. Hmm. All right. Well, then that excuse is like you know, if he was in his thirties now, I could say, well, Jesus, he was like twenty. You saying at a party and he brushed up against a woman? Oh my God! Let's throw him in the gulag. Um, but I mean, th- from what you just described it, to me. If you're at a, in a social situation and you hit on someone, you know, not that you assault them, but you make a pass of some kind and it's rejected. And then you say something like, oh, I get, you know, oh, you're a celibate. How weird. I, you know, that's like that shouldn't ruin your political career. <laughs> in my opinion, that's not a reason. That's nothing. That, to me, that's nothing. But, you know, maybe I don't know all the details. And th- then it was then there was. as So as that comes out. To double down on that, because what you said really isn't a story, I guess. Some people that got changed out in the campaign, he got new campaign managers and knew this and knew that. Then the old people were like, well, he was a misogynist and he was a horrible guy. And I'm like, you know, I was there not for every campaign meeting, but I was there enough. And that's just not his bag. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, but look, they'll go to this every time they, they did it to Bernie Sanders for crying out loud, you know, that he was, uh, he was a sexist. He had said that no woman could ever be president or something like that, which is clearly not true that he didn't say that, but yeah, no, th- this is a, this is how, um, the neoliberal wing of the democratic party, uh, plays it. It it works with the Democratic Party faithful, I think. Really, you know, I don't. I think people who are not uh, on the le- far left or even on the left, really, but who are just Democrats, you know, will listen to this kind of s- story. And uh, and it also gives people who are really, uh, you know, they're Democrats, but they're not on the left, an excuse to not walk their talk, you know, whatever their talk might be. So yeah, I you know. The, the DSA, SFDSA rescinded their endorsement and someone else rescinded their endorsement. I can't remember. Oh, Jesus. And, and it, it and here we are, like it kind of, it, it made me think like this. This is how my thought process was, is, um, and I'm pretty excited to talk to him next week. Um, here we have this moment in political history where we're actually getting victories, where there's some Decent leftists getting into office post AOC, right? Or post Bernie Sanders running for president. You got Jamal Bowman, who beat Elliot Engel. Uh, AOC took out a longtime uh, Democrat. Mm-hmm. You got Rashida Tlaib in there, Ilhan Omar. And here you have this guy, Ch- Charles Booker, gave Amy McGrath a huge run for her money yeah. in that election. If it wasn't for voter suppression, I really believe that he wins that, that Democratic uh, primary and has a great chance against a much hated Mitch McConnell. And here you have this guy for the first time running against Nancy Pelosi's running to her left. One of the most, if not most powerful person in, in politics, not just woman, one of the most powerful people in politics could be taken down by a real deal leftist. And here we are bickering about, was he mean to staffers? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, but on the okay, I have two thoughts, and they're kind of contradictory as always. On the one hand, I'm with you; like, I I can't believe that that's going to be what people care about. Um, but on the other hand, I worry that we're investing too much hope in the left wing of the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, that you know that after Sanders didn't get the nomination, I mean, like my whole thought about the the nominating process for for Sanders and what his campaign was about was that it would be about 
doing damage to the Democratic Party <laughs> uh-huh. rather than rather than uh, taking it over and, and like I, I and was saving them, it. Yeah, I was seeing them split and maybe we'd get something like a Labor Party in the U.S. out of it. And I wasn't even sure what that would do. And and to from my perspective right now, what I'm trying to do myself, and I don't know how helpful this is going to be, but what I'm trying to do myself is start from the ground floor thinking and say, OK, we're in an economic crisis. The system itself is sort of eating itself. We're, we're being asked for human sacrifice. The working class will have to actually fight against the tendency of the system itself in order to survive. So, you know, what, where will, where does that lead us politically? Like what, what kinds of political institutions uh, do we need right now? Uh, You know, and I, and the only thing I can come up with first off, like right now is a strong workers movement that's organizing in its own self-interest around their jobs and making political demands like job guarantees, you know, uh, affordable housing, so forth, but not necessarily going into for any of that to be funneled into campaigns right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, like, uh, and then from there, I, the question is like, okay, well, what went wrong with the Soviet Union? What what have, what do we need to do around this issue of the Vanguard Party? It's mm-hmm. like a party is needed, but like what kind and and you know that's that's where I'm like headed next. But basically, I want to be a revolutionary. I want to say, like this this is so broken and it has been for so long, but since March, so clearly broken that we we're gonna have to do something really radical and we're gonna have to organize ourselves and overcome a lot of our hangups in short order. And uh, you know, and I expect that my YouTube channel will be exactly what everyone needs <laughs> don't forget the patreon right <laughs> yeah that's right and oh and my patreon please donate on my patreon no i don't know i mean it's very like uh, this is what i can do i don't know if i know it's not nearly enough but um but it seems to me that to turn towards Thinking, rethinking socialist politics right now might seem like a a move to to uh, quietism or you know like a an impotent move, but I think it's better than just doing whatever we th- has been doing that seems like it's practical, like trying to change the Democratic Party. That seems from, very from practical. within, from within, yeah, um, well, or even from without. Actually, I mean, it's I don't think that institution is. Uh, it has a lot of potential to be a radical fighting force for, for, for working class people in this country. What do you think about like the green party and the, and the PSL and and stuff like that? You know, uh, I, I think that um, they may have more potential uh, in terms of their uh, starting ideological position, like, but that their the model and their aims are still going to be towards basically managing capital as it is, and that again, like you know, something born out of worker struggles more directly, a, a party that would come out of the organ of you know the come from the working class or come out of the struggles of the working class that are happening right now would be something I'd be more interested in than than, than the Green Party. I mean, I've been around the Green Party. It's actually the Green Party is really just a pressure group on the Democratic mm-hmm. Party. It's not actually mm-hmm. a party that's seeking political power, just like the Libertarian Party is not really a, an actual you know political party. It's a it's a pressure tactic put on the Republican Party. That, Isn't you know, that the kind of their job though? Like we want to oh, push yeah, I'm you not further to the left. Well, look how well it's worked out. But um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I think I don't know what it means really ultimately to push something further to the left within the, I mean, the left wing of capital is still capital and it's actually Mm. filled with a lot of delusions. Like, you know, okay, we can make capitalism better by raising everyone's wages. Like, well, we should fight for higher wages, but we shouldn't expect for that not to do damage to the economic system. Because the reason that the wages are pushed down is not because 
our bosses are all greedy bastards, although they all are. It's because, you know, in order to make a profit, you have to push down wages, especially when profitability is suffering. So, you know, there are systemic reasons why the interests of the working class and the interests of the capitalist bourgeois class are not the same. And no amount of, uh, you know, kind of welfare state, New Deal kind of politics is going to overcome those systemic reasons why the working class and the bourgeois class don't have any material interests in common. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, uh, and it sounds very, you know, strident and radical, but it's, I do admit that the, the, the danger here is that I'm just being a purist, you know, and like I'm looking at gift horse in the mouth when it comes to these to the left kind of candidates or something like the green party. Um, and look, if Bernie Sanders was a nominee, right. You know, I would be maybe saying something a little bit different, but he's not. And we are looking at, uh, you know, something along the lines of 30 million evictions or somewhere 20 to 30. is what I've heard. Uh, um, yep. I heard, I think it's closer to 40, but I think you're right on yeah. 30, but I've seen closer to 40. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, def it's definitely frightening, man. It's frightening to see like before, before we started. And if you've listened to the show before anyone listening right now, you know, I always talk about the neighborhood where I do this show out of, which is, which is very, very filled with, with the unhoused. And as this goes longer, this population gets bigger. There's a few hundred people across the street from me living in cars and RVs and, I was telling Doug somebody stole a city bus. <laughs> so, Jeez. <laughs> I was like, props. <laughs> props to you. That took some balls. <laughs> there is a Muni bus here from San Francisco. Someone drove that bitch over the bridge that you get even more props for that shit. Yeah. Uh, but but that being said, like I I feel like a lot of these demands that people have been having for a while in cities like Oakland and even Chicago about housing being unaffordable. It, it wasn't catching on like it's catching on now because COVID is just showing how thin this shit was holding everything together. If it was yeah. holding anything together. Yeah. We had a paycheck to paycheck economy where like half of people's income were going towards rent on a good day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. You know, in Oakland, I don't know. I mean, I had relatives that were paying like two thirds of their income to rent and uh, that they ended up moving to Kansas um, just because they could find an affordable place there, I guess. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a very precarious uh, economic system. It's like it, capitalism is chaos. Mm -hmm. Capitalism is crisis. Mm-hmm. The struggle for socialism is a struggle to return to, you know, not to return to anything, but to create, uh, uh, you know, some something like a community again, to, to, to have people work together for people's needs and to take charge of, of the way we organize ourselves rather than have this kind of done behind our back uh, through a system that nobody seems to control. And, and there was a book that the... Uh the late great Michael Brooks referenced and, and I, it was my first zero books purchase. It was capitalist realism. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Fisher, Mark Fisher, another, an, I mean, the, I don't another know. Late one of, great. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I tell you, it's a weird situation to be uh, at an imprint where probably now the two biggest sellers we're going to have are both mm. selling so large, uh, you know, so, so many numbers so much of the, so many copies because of the premature deaths of both of these guys. I mean, in the case of Michael Brooks, it's just, you know, you want to yell at, uh, at God. It just doesn't, yeah. he's 36 <laughs> years old. That was, that was uh, crazy. And he, and I knew him, you know, I was, I was friends with him. I, I would count him as one of my friends. And, um, uh, he, uh, he was ambitious as fuck, and he he was not in any way thinking about slowing down at all. He was on his way to mattering, and not just like as a political uh, commentator, but as a political person, as a as a force for good in American politics. 
Michael Brooks was was headed uh, up. And, um, you know, I, don't, I, I think he even he in the last couple of months was not sure what, what to do next or how to how to move forward. He was interested in trying to talk about empathy along with uh, radical politics. And I think that was a, a necessary move. Um, but I'm really, you know, it's depressing it's, and terrible that we're not going to see where he ended up. We're not going to get to, to watch what he does next or benefit from oh, what, it, what he's thinking. It hurts, man. I uh, I was re-listening to the show I did with Bur- Ben Burgess, and he had sent me a message, and he said, Michael Brooks would have loved this this jab you, you threw at me about this Jesse Lee Peterson thing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, what did uh, you think of that? What did you think of Jesse Lee and and ben Hey Drew? man, I I I'll tell you like I told Ben's ass. I was like, "Check it, man. First of all, I don't know no no black people that know this dude." Oh, yeah. There's no there's no black people <laughs> that I know, and I'm not sitting around here. I I told you a few of the cats that I know, but on the, the whole, I know regular ass cats and right. they don't know this motherfucker. That's <laughs> right. First and first and foremost. Right. Second of all, there's some dudes you can't come at with all the knowledge because to them you're the enemy. And and there's a lot of s- crazy self-hate in that shit, but it's yeah. it's on that uh Chris Rock had a joke about that about how the motherfucker that comes back from prison gets more respect than the motherfucker that comes back from college. Yeah. And that's kind of how you're going to come off to that dude. Right. So you can't you can't sit there when he goes, what is logic? Yeah, that's a dumbass question. That's a dumbass question. Right. And you can't answer that in the nice way. And you got to kind of come at him the way he came at you. And I told I told Ben, I was like, no, nah, Ben, you got to be like, man, fuck you and everybody that looks like you. Don't come at me like that anymore. And I will slap the fire out of your ass if you ever in your life talk to me like that again. Yeah. And I say that jokingly, you know, Ben Burgess isn't going to say that to probably anybody. Right. Uh, that's right. <laughs> he's not. But, but that's how that dude is going to get handled in that situation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think I agree with you in, in, uh, on the one hand, like if you want to just reach like, a uh, the everyday people or might, might check that out, but there's no one who's an everyday person was watching that anyway. But, um, if you want to actually get at Jesse and make him think twice and like get his respect and change the course of the conversation, what you're saying is absolutely right. However, from my <laughs> from from my perspective, I loved it. Ben Burgess lost fair and square, and you know it was on brand. He was a logic nerd for our imprint, and there we all learned a lesson that that <laughs> only works. <laughs> And it didn't hurt book sales at all, so I'm I'm fine with it. Whatever, you know that was that was great. We all got a good laugh, so I yeah, I'm, it it was good. That was my feeling about it. I told him not to worry about it. And Michael Brooks made a hay out of it for weeks and weeks. Oh, that shit was hilarious for yeah. the longest time when he was just a beta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm I would telling saying you, that to Michael, you know, I, I mean to uh, Ben, I would, <laughs> I would message him and just say one word email, <laughs> beta. <laughs> so yeah. like that shit, it's it's so it's so funny because again, there's cats like that in my family. There's cats like that I grew up with. Um, I call this show like a nuanced barbershop talk, like. You're going to see cats like that in the barbershop. And when you're having that, that deep discussion and sometimes discussion, ain't even that deep, sometimes discussion is like, you know, who's better, Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali. And then that cat comes at you with that beta shit. And it's like, look, (laughs) (laughs) Doug Lane, are you a bit of a sports fan? 
No, not really, but I know who matters like culturally. Okay. It was Muhammad Ali. I mean, definitely. He could be Bruce Lee. You know, I, <laughs> I think Bruce Lee would have gotten Muhammad's ass. I don't know. I saw the comic book when I was a kid. <laughs> Muhammad Lee, Ali won. He would have gotten his ass. <laughs> okay, all right. Bruce was getting in Cat's ass. But real talk, no, Muhammad Ali... But that's the conversation that's had. And sometimes it gets to a point you're like, look, I'm going to be one more beta. You got one more time to say it. And I'm going to come over there. I'm going to put this phone down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm going to make you say it again. Because Ben Bird just don't look like a little dude. No, he's not. You know, he's not a little guy. He's But he's getting smaller. He's running and getting in better shape. But he's, yeah, he's a, uh, but I don't think he's much of a fighter either. Uh, uh but and look, there was no chance for a physical altercation. It was a no. Zoom call or something. Yeah, 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 but yeah. but 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 you know, some sort of big dick energy needed to come out at that moment. And and uh, and uh, what came out was you know big uh, protractor energy. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, shit, yeah, no, that shit was awesome. Yeah, I loved it though. I mean, I I thought, and look, that guy has. If you watch his Jesse's show, for he does the same routine uh, on everybody. He loves to get uh, uh, people on the show and just ask them things like, you know, are you a man? Uh, yeah, uh, that kind of stuff. Fucked uh, up questions. He has. Fu- he's. I think the first. I think he started out like you don't want black people to have money like you because you're a professor i'm like how many rich professors do you know <laughs> right if yeah. he's talking to you he ain't rich yeah i think one of the things he said was like um why didn't bernie sanders instead of talking about socialism teach people how to make a million dollars like he did yeah uh, some bullshit and, uh, like that yeah it's like okay well here's why here here would be bernie sanders get rich quick uh mm. lesson uh like be in politics for 40 years <laughs> yeah. lose a major presidential <laughs> election write, write a one. book <laughs> yeah. so you know it's like kind of like steve martin's uh, how to be a millionaire routine it's like how to be a millionaire first you make a million dollars second when the tax man comes just say i forgot <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you know, and 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 to you know to, to kind of draw this this conversation back into what we were saying before about yeah, the, yeah. the left and, bu- and building a strong left. What's really hard, and I find this at my job, it's hard to build a strong left in certain communities when you've been kind of sold this bill of goods that black capitalism is going to save black people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can save some black people, though, really. I mean, that's the thing. It's like when the problem is like every everything's so individualized. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, So, you know, it uh, and the other thing is it's really hard to tell people who are really struggling. Oh, yeah. You ought to join the movement because. (laughs) Yeah. What you'll get from it as an individual is possibly an ulcer. And, uh, you know, you'll get targeted more from the cops and, uh, you know, probably eventually you'll be called out as a sexual harasser or some shit. like Oh, that. God. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what I mean, it's not a great culture uh, overall. And it's and it's there's not a lot to recommend it for people who are not academics right now. I mean, it's a pretty good gig if you're an academic to be on the left It's part probably necessary. But if you're like a regular <laughs> working class person in America, being on the left isn't really a great idea. Being part of a working class movement is, but it's kind of it's it's on you to make it. It's not really yeah. pre made for you. Yeah, no, that's real. Yeah, that's real, so, and it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get right. cats out of that mindset that you know I'm just waiting for my my million dollar moment. Oprah told me to think positive. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it is. Uh, but, you know, I, I think that once, I wonder, is it easier to talk to people who are over 40 about this stuff? 
<laughs> you know, I I have I have certain issues and I talk to coworkers and 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 also people in the industry that I'm in. And I think younger cat, definitely younger cats are, are starting to get up on this stuff and asking questions. I think we're in a really perfect political moment because we've never had the lines drawn so perfectly. I think even George Bush Jr. I call him Jr. Uh, he still blurred a line because he was he was funny and cool, if you will. He was in Harold and Kumar, right? right? So for a lot of people, they don't really get how horrible of a president he was, or people can't really remember that time anymore. Yeah, Bill Clinton definitely blurred, blurred a line that motherfucker was on Arsenio Hall. Yeah, right. I got to stay up late to watch Arsenio. He, he was our first black president. Ah, oh, yeah. That's Why what they said. Say? <laughs> they said that shit so much. My grandma met his ass when he was running, and my gra he like charmed the shit out of my grandma and like mm -hmm. her church friends mm -hmm. uh, for a big fundraiser. Uh, she she loved him. Uh, that being said, Donald Trump is that bad guy in a Batman movie. <laughs> yeah. Who's not supposed to really be that bad. Right. It's like Danny DeVito in the, the what the second Batman movie. With we, yeah. <laughs> where he's like a penguin or some shit. Yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. Like, he's literally that bad. Like he says the shit. You're like blood. You're not supposed to say that. Like, why'd you say that? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You could have been not. But that's that was his brand when he was like Donald Trump, the douchebag gajillionaire. Yeah. On, on The Apprentice. You ever see that show? Yeah, but even before that, when he was an asshole in Home Alone too. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He's just been in that's his whole thing, man. Think back to all them shitty ass news shows that we had to watch before you had twenty four hour news when it was like hard copy and current yeah, right. affair. And Jerry and, Springer. Oh, remember that shit. And when <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump would come on there, he would be an asshole. He would be a rich asshole. Matt Taibbi said it. It was it's like professional wrestling for this dude. He doesn't understand the difference between professional wrestling and politics. So that makes it easier for people to decide. Okay, well, that is the bad guy. He is yeah. obviously the bad guy. Yeah. Sometimes the bad guy can be sexy, is the problem. But not with Trump. It's impossible now. But had uh, he won in the eighties, maybe, but not now. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean, sometimes being bad can be its own kind of cool but uh not not with trump not anymore i think right now i mean look the reason everyone's abandoning trump is because you know his even his base doesn't want to die of covid and they look at this guy <laughs> yep and they say this guy is not good for me uh i i i you know when he was when the stock market was up and unemployment was down Maybe I could look the other way on this shit, but now he's clearly an incompetent and we're looking at, you know, historic lows of, I mean, historic highs of unemployment, historic, everything's shitty historically, like everything is as bad as it ever has been. And we haven't seen anything yet. And we all kind of know it. So, yeah, he's out. I think, uh, I don't think he's going to, you can't come he, back. I don't think you he's going to be reelected. No, I don't think he can, but but what is, I mean, what, what were we talking about? What were we aiming here? Oh, I ask you if people over 40 are easier to talk to about not becoming millionaires. I mean, like, yeah, uh, I think you know, so. I think so. Yeah, I think so. You get to be a certain age and you, the reason you have a midlife crisis is because you realize, oh yeah, this is fucking it. <laughs> <laughs> this is as good as it's going to get. Right now, this, I'm only, all I have to look forward to, and I mean, I'm about to be 50. All I've got to look forward to is maybe a colostomy bag in 20 years. You know, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't have, I'm not. Losing uh, some I'm, teeth. Yeah, losing some teeth. Yeah, great. Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got a floss more. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've got to look forward to. I don't have, you know, my uh, Emmy Award or anything like that. You know, I'm not going to win the big trophy I, I i this is the level of success i've reached boom this is it so what am i here for now it's not it's be it's being okay with that it, you, you know it, that <laughs> that's sometimes the hard part is like being okay with your mm -hmm. levels of success like back to back to boots riley um mm -hmm. i did a lot of touring with my ex and we went we would play like 100 150 shows a year and we went all over the planet and she just had a nervous breakdown and left and so 
Boos would always introduce me as this is Jason from the Fin Absolute Demon. He's in a band with his wife, la la la. And so I saw him, I was like, and he's, he's introduced me to somebody as Jason from the Fin Absolute, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, Boots, she left. And he stares at me. He goes, hmm, well, at least you can say you did more. He goes, how long were you guys together again? I said, seven years. He goes, you did more in seven years than most people will ever do in their whole life. And you should be happy with that. I didn't want to hear it at the time. No. <laughs> but no. when you sit back and think, you're like, oh, all the people that I dug – that I wanted to dig me, dig me. Right. And I did it. Look, man, I tell you, when you, when I, I mean, I didn't know about your band, but when you showed me footage from your band, I get to listen to what you were doing. And you told me a little bit about what you're doing. And, and mm -hmm. then you told me, oh, I'm excited to talk to you. I was like, fuck, I've made it. I'm done. I don't have to do anything more. <laughs> I, <laughs> this guy in Oakland, who's clearly a lot cooler than I am, wants to talk to me. All right. I've done it. So thank you very much. It's made up for everything that ever happened to me in high school. I would have been, hey, I, we would have been cool in high school because yeah, I would have sure. been like, I'd be like, hey, man, go fuck with Doug. He got all the good comics and and he'll explain to you why Dune sucks so bad. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> that was basically me. That's important. No, oh, it's important work. It's God's work. But, uh, well, listen, we've been talking for about an hour. Should we, yeah. what, sh what should we do to wrap, wrap this, this, this uh, version of this up? Cause we should talk again for sure. I think you should what, come on my show. I would love to come on the dude. You know how juiced I'd be to be talking to Doug Lane on the Doug Lane show. That would be awesome. It's called uh, something else. I don't remember. Uh, zero squared or some stupid thing like that. But you got yeah. some, yeah, some, fa if, and I get the fancy music and shit, and I get yeah. the crazy, oh, the max headroom. Yeah, I get the max headroom. You would get the max oh. headroom. I would, I break that out of mothballs just for you, Doug. So, you said nothing but a word, my man. Now I got to get you Blazers tickets. Now I got to figure out how to get you Blazers oh, tickets. So, all right, if they're ever gonna be a game again. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're <laughs> are they opening again the well they're playing everything down in uh in florida okay they're in a weird bubble in florida okay all right then. jesus christ yeah uh what are so doug lane has zero books and you have a podcast and you have, have what else Okay, I, okay, I got. I run the published Zero Books, which is a critical theory imprint that's out of the UK, but I'm an ugly American who runs it. Uh, I I do a YouTube channel. Type in Zero Books into YouTube, you'll find our YouTube channel. We do a podcast every week, a couple of them. I've I've roped my kids into doing them with me too now. So for patrons, you get to listen to me talk to my kids. Um, the, so there's like four different podcasts that we we run out of there, and I'm also the author of of books such as last week's apocalypse bash bash revolution uh after the saucers landed uh, what else? uh that's oh uh, you know just look me up and uh it was great fun to to be on your show all right well don't hang up and i'm gonna play some music don't hang up thank okay, you Doug. there's up. gonna be links to everything don't hang up